Hi, everybody. Welcome to Trial Alchemy. I'm Monty McIntyre, your host, and today I'm delighted to have with me as my guest, Stephen Quattlebaum. And Stephen is a excellent ABOTA member and trial lawyer and the president of National ABOTA this year in 2023 as our guest. So let me tell you a little bit about Steve Quattlebaum. He is with the law firm of Quattlebaum, Grooms, and Tall in Little Rock, Arkansas. Steve has been practicing law since 1983 when he got his JD degree from the University of Arkansas School of Law. He does primarily defense work, but he has also tried a number of plaintiff's cases. Now, Steve's very experienced. He's tried approximately 80 jury trials as lead counsel including cases dealing with products liability, toxic tort, environmental, breach of fiduciary duty, breach of contract, premises liability, copyright infringement, vehicle accident, and other cases. And he's also tried many non-jury trials. Now, Steve's uh, very distinguished in terms of places who have admitted him. He's a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers since 2017 a fellow in the International Academy of Trial Lawyers since 2004. He's the current national president of the American Board of Trial Advocates and is completing a very successful year. And he was the Arkansas chapter president 2004. And because he's serving as the president, he served in numerous other offices for National Aboda. Steve's been listed in the best lawyers in America since 2001. He's currently recognized in the areas of bet the company litigation, commercial litigation, insurance law, mass tort litigation and class actions for defendants, personal injury litigation for defendants, and product liability litigation for defendants. So Steve, without any further ado, and I won't go through your entire very impressive resume, but thank you for being a guest today on Trial Alchemy. It's great to have you. Well, thank you, Monty. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let's jump right in. So you've tried a lot of cases, and one of the things I'd like to ask my guests is, you know, what's one of your most satisfying trial back victories or results? You know, um, I, I, I'll say this, first of all, that I consider myself to be a student of trying cases, a student of being a trial lawyer. and. and to that end, it's, you know, it's always a learning experience and you learn more from your losses, or at least I do, from your victories. But um, one of the most satisfying would undoubtedly be a case that I tried for the plaintiff, along with my partner, John Tull. John and I were in the same class in law school and we practiced together our entire careers and we've tried probably 20 or so jury trials together at least. In any event, um, Bill Willis was a plaintiff in a lender liability case where the bank, from our perspective, had mistreated him very badly, resulting in um, a tremendous loss to him, both individually and the decline and, and demise of his company. And we successfully brought that case against the bank, which was a a foreign bank. The case was here in Arkansas, and we achieved a very successful result in favor of Mr. Willis with a nice verdict that put him back on his feet. And one of the reasons it's the most satisfying is because he's one of the, not only the best client you could ever hope to have, but also mm -hmm. just a great individual, and it worked out really well for him. That's on the plaintiff side. And then on the defense side, there have been a number of cases that have have brought a great deal of satisfaction, but certainly um, the one that I that I look to as sort of a springboard for my career was a case that I tried in 2006 in Arkansas, again, with John Tull. Mm -hmm. And it was on behalf of the welding industry and the welding industry had been sued across the country in a number of cases um, on based on a claim that the fumes from arc welding caused a brain injury. Mm -hmm. We successfully defended that case with a defense verdict. That led to me being 
retained to try cases in the MDL with involving the welding industry. And that resulted in cases in other states, which then led to hip litigation for Johnson and Johnson, which then led to talc litigation. And so that's the reason I look upon that case with, with a particular degree of fondness because it allowed me to try cases in a variety of jurisdictions, very challenging cases that um, I enjoyed the work very much. It was quite difficult, but it was good work to have. And, and it was, the cases were interesting and challenging. Well, thanks for those examples. And I wanted to maybe talk a little bit about some of the things you said. I agree with you. I think we learn more when we lose or have a bad result that we don't like. But um, I also agree with you. We never know everything about trying cases. And even as experienced as you are, you're still learning as you try your cases, right? No, there's no question about that. I, and I learn from my opponents. You know, whether you're trying the case against someone who's tried dozens of jury trials and has had tremendous success, or you're trying a case, frankly, against someone who hasn't tried very many cases, but has worked really hard to get prepared for that particular trial. You you can always learn things from your opponent and you can, and they, when, when they work, the sting stings harder because they're on <laughs> the other side. And when they, when techniques don't particularly work and you're able to sort of take advantage of that, you learn from that too. You learn from their mistakes as well as their uh, positive uh, attributes in the middle of trial. Absolutely. And, and there's another thing, and I'm sure we're going to see some examples of this today, but Steve, uh, wouldn't you agree with me that in the art of trying jury trials, there's so many times when there's no one way to do things, and there's a variety of different approaches. Oh, yeah, there's certainly a variety of approaches. And, and you know, that goes to one of the things that we always teach when we're teaching young lawyers how to try cases, which is you have to be yourself. And so there are a lot of techniques out there that are that that work really well for some people. Some don't work so well for others. And you have to find the techniques and then adjust and edit those techniques to fit your own style. And so that your your credibility is, uh, of course, the hallmark of a good trial lawyer. And if you're doing things and you're trying to adopt a particular technique of someone else and it doesn't fit you as an individual very well, it directly affects your credibility and that's not good. That is a terrible thing. And I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, would, it, would you agree that credibility is awfully important in a trial setting? You know, when I was in law school, there was a lawyer here in Arkansas named Buddy Sutton. And Mr. Sutton was the dean of the defense bar in Arkansas. And he came to our law school and he talked to us about being trial lawyers. And his opening line was, there is one thing that is essential to a good trial lawyer, and it is credibility. That jury has to believe you. And if you are not honest with the jury, they will see it, they will know it immediately, and you will lose credibility. And if you ever lose credibility on one point, then it washes over to other points that you're trying to make in the trial. The jury just loses confidence and trust in you. So yes, mm -hmm. credibility is vitally important to the skill set of a of an, a good trial lawyer. Well, credibility of the trial lawyer is critical and key, but I think a good trial lawyer also tries to make sure you can't control this completely. <laughs> You got to make sure you've got a credible client, credible experts, credible witnesses, because if any of those people are not believable or have lied or something, that's going to be terrible for your case too, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It, obviously, your key witnesses in your case that if you're on the defense side and 
that witness is the corporate representative of the company or the president of the company, some face or voice of the company, that, that person has to have great credibility. And if you're on the plaintiff's side, the plaintiff, it must be credible in order for the outcome of the case to be as good as it ought to be. You might still win, but if the case, if the client had been more credible, um, the outcome probably would have been better. Yeah, it can make a big difference in dollars, uh, depending upon how the client does on the plaintiff side. Now, you've tried cases in a number of different states. Yes, and sir. have you found that this critical importance of credibility for both the trial lawyer and other parties, is it the same everywhere you've tried a case? Um, the same. I, here's what I would say about that. There are jurisdictions where there is a skepticism of one side or the other. In some jurisdictions, there's a dramatic skepticism of a corporate defendant, for example. Mm -hmm. In other jurisdictions, there is a profound skepticism of a plaintiff because in some jurisdictions, there is there are members of the jury who are vocal and persuasive in the jury room who come into the jury room thinking that Plaintiffs are out to make money where they shouldn't. They're not out to get compensated. They're out to make money. And there are, in other jurisdictions, jurors who come into the jury room and are persuasive and influential in the jury room who think that all big companies are bad. And so um, credibility, whether you're on the plaintiff side or defense side, is essential in all jurisdictions, but with some some spectrum in there of where that credibility fits with that particular jury in that particular location. So I think it's a nuanced um, answer to that question. But well, there is an overarching element of credibility, no matter where you're trying the case. Yeah, and, and type, different. you've tried a lot of different types of cases, and, and you have different juror or bias tendencies in different kinds of cases too. So sometimes I'm sure when you're representing some corporate defendants, either in a particular jurisdiction or other things, there may be some potential juror bias, juror bias you have to deal with. Or yeah. same thing on the plaintiff side, like you've just mentioned. So it's there everywhere. It just varies depending upon the issue or the parties or whatever. Yeah, that, I completely agree with that. Okay. In some jurisdictions, you know, personal injury cases uh, are viewed with skepticism, right. and yet, and but business cases on the plaintiff side are not viewed with skepticism. In other jurisdictions, cases between two significant businesses are viewed with some degree of skepticism about why are they taking up our time? They're so big and powerful, we shouldn't even be here. <laughs> Well, so now in doing your work and more defense work, uh, but you've also done plaintiffs, um, I'm sure over the years you've developed, uh, when, when I think about the prep time you need near the end of a case to get ready for that trial, it's kind of a process where you may need a month or some period of time that varies depending upon the nature of the case, the length of the trial, the issues. But have you developed some standard routines or ways that you get prepared for that trial in that final time period to get ready to go? Monty, what a great question that is. So, yes, um, one of the things that I and, and especially in what I would consider modern trials, there's they are document intensive and yep. more so than they used to be because we got more documents, we got more emails, we got more texts, we got whatever it is, it, electronic discovery results in the generation of a lot of documents. So what I try to do is to identify what I refer to as the hot documents. So that's nothing uh, exclusive to me. A lot of people call them the hot documents. And I get in a big conference room and I spread them out all over the table. And I may put them in chronological order, or I may put them in some kind of uh, categorization, which is frequently referred to as a, a module. And then for purposes of cross-examination, you want to, you want to 
try to figure out what is your approach to the cross going to be? Are you going to start out with your strongest point first? Or are you going to take it in chronological order? Is there some other buildup that has to take place? Or are you going to lay a foundation and then, uh, which might be referred to as a trap and then spring the trap later? Yep. For purposes of opening statement, how are you going to tell the story? We all know the power of a story. And part of the power of the story is making sure that you have used the appropriate number of documents or things or demonstratives that illustrate that story and support it with factual support so that it's so that the story has strength not only in the storyline and plot, but the story has strength in the support that comes from the, those documents and sometimes from deposition testimony that's built into that story as well. So that's something that I try to do in every case early, as early as possible, but certainly when you're getting ready and you've had a theme that you've been working on through the discovery, then you bring that together to develop that story in the most persuasive um, construction that you can get for it. And, you know, when you're thinking about your story that you're going to tell in opening statement and other parts of the trial, uh, a very important part of the story is what you leave out because you got to put in the most important stuff, right? That's for sure. Yeah, it, it's uh, separating the wheat from the chaff, sort of. But you, you've got to develop that storyline. And then it, one of the things that I have to tell myself over and over when I'm getting ready for trial is to get out of the weeds. The yeah. jurors. They, they, you can overwhelm them with information and they don't know what the takeaway is. And especially in opening statement, you need to frame the case in such a way that it allows them to hear the evidence over the next several days or weeks and put it into that framework that you've built for them. And that they're, then their takeaway from the opening is a takeaway that hopefully is favorable to your side and allows them to then accept that notion or framework of the case. And then as you build the case from there, you're constantly trying to support those statements that you made in opening and that story that you told in opening. Well, the story I think is so important and I, I want your take on this. This is going to be interesting is in my experience in trying cases, and I've only been trying cases in California, but it seems to me over the years that the story you have to tell ultimately is some kind of a morality story of right and wrong, some kind of principle or value, and you can't get too hung up in all the law stuff that we get hung up in because you're talking to real people. And they got to feel they got a way to understand it. So do you try to think about those things and coming up with your story? There are so many um, good ways to construct a story. You know, the Pixar story spine yeah. is a great story spine. And I, I don't have it memorized, but it's something like once upon a time there was a boy and every day he did this and the next day he would do that. And then one day, and then you go into a change. And because of that, something else happened. And because of that, another thing happened until, and then you get to sort of the, the moral of the story, the emotional appeal, the um, ethical dilemma if you, is part of a story. So yeah, there's, there are all kinds of ways to do that. And you know, I'm constantly reading books about telling stories and how trial lawyers tell stories. And there are a lot of really good ones out there, but developing a compelling story is, is a very powerful tool and technique in the trial. It sure is. So in thinking about your story, and you mentioned this earlier, you have developed a theme, usually when you're working up your case, maybe from the very beginning, which is pretty common, so what are some of the most successful themes that you've used in some of your jury trials that you've uh, that you've had good experience with? You know, there's um, there's a common theme that, that used long before me and and is used on a regular basis on the defense side. And that is 
the good company story combined with this case and this plaintiff. Frequently what, what you see is the, the construction of the story on the other side is not really about this particular case. It's about a what if, what if something else had happened? Mm. <laughs> you know, the, the reptile strategy is very popular right now. And I will say it is an extremely effective strategy. On the it is. Side. And it can be a very effective strategy on the defense side if the facts are just right for it to work. But part of the reptile appeal is the what if. What if this had gone a different way? What if that person had hit a school bus instead of a car? Or what if that person, uh, the defendant, had been driving at night instead of during the day? And what terrible catastrophe could have happened? So one theme on the defense side is this case is about this case. It's not about another case. It's not about a fictional case. It's about this case. And it's about this particular plaintiff. Mm -hmm. And that theme can work especially well if there, if there are some difficulties and challenges on the plaintiff side of the case that you can then bring out about that case. On the plaintiff side, you know, the theme that just works over and over again is that somebody put profits ahead of safety. Yep. And if you can prove it, it is a great theme. And it's a theme that, that will work almost every time because we all know that shouldn't be the case. Yep. Okay. So uh, any other, and you did been on the plaintiff side, but any other good themes that you've seen from your opponents that you thought, wow, that was a good theme? Uh, a couple of themes and structures. Um, I tried a case where the plaintiff's counsel divided the case into chapters in a book hmm. in the opening statement. This is a case about, described the case in, in a, like the title of a book. The PowerPoint slide deck showed a book with the cover and you opened it up. You had the table of contents and you only had, I think he had four or five chapters in the book. Hmm and then went through the description of the book and the chapters and had organized the presentation of the case in that way, it was a beautiful opening. And I, mm -hmm. I appreciated it. I've adopted it since that time when I could. And so that's one, it's more of a structure than a theme. Right. With themes embedded in each one of those, which gets me to another point, which is, you know, the storyboard of a movie is typically divided into three different brackets, and it's a big overarching theme broken down into three sub themes, broken down into factual supporting elements. And that's another good structure for developing the story because it just creates a nice flow and it's a flow that we're accustomed to. Yeah. Great, great examples there. So I want to ask you a question. I do love asking all my Aboda guests, and there's always a variety of answers, which I love because nothing is exactly one way. So what's, in your experience and in your opinion, what is the most important part of a jury trial and why? Uh, um, again, sort of depends on the case. You know, the, I think many people think the frequent answer is it's the opening statement. <laughs> and there's good support for that. I've, had, I've worked with a lot of really talented um, jury consultants who will tell you that the value of the opening statement is that you create, a, like we were talking about earlier, a framework, number yep. one. But you also create, if, you, if it's done well and if it sticks, you've created a filter for the jury to filter out the evidence that they don't fit, they don't think fits the story that they have in their heads and to filter through or allow through the evidence that does support the story that they have in their minds about what this case is really about. And so if you've told a compelling story and that story has been adopted by at least some of the jurors, right. then as, as the evidence comes in, they use that evidence to support the story that they think is the truth. And, and I'm a big believer in jury trials, obviously, but, and so I think that most of the time what they think is the truth is the truth. And 
<laughs> so, uh, so that that is a very important element of a trial to create that framework and that that filtering mechanism. But I think another essential part of the trial is the cross examination of the opposing witnesses, <clears throat> especially the key witnesses. If you're on the defense side, the cross examination of the plaintiff is often critical to the case, but sometimes the plaintiff is essentially irrelevant to the case. Right. And it's a case between experts. And so right. it's an examination of the expert witness, or it's a cross examination of the of the treating physician. There, there are always identified witnesses who can pivot the case one way or the other. They can either sell the case through their direct examination and withstand the cross, or they can wither under the cross examination and the case sort of falls apart right there. And you can often, you can sort of feel it happening in the middle of the trial. Yeah. Well, before I ask you the next question, I'll tell you that uh, I'm sure you've had this experience. Sometimes it's one of the hardest jobs you have as a trial lawyer, is sit there and keep a poker face oh. when your expert or other witness is being beat up really badly on the stand and you don't want to show any evidence that you're getting hurt. <laughs> that is so true. Well, in dealing with cross, let's talk about that for a second, because, you know, the standard typical training that almost all lawyers still get in law schools is, well, the only way you do a cross is a, a, what I would call the closed cross or classic cross where you control the witness. There's only a yes or no. You don't want them to say anything else. And that's very common. It's very effective, but it's not the only kind of cross out there. And then as an example, I would say a very different kind of cross I would call an open cross. And it's kind of epitomized by people like Jerry Spence, where they're not really worried about the answer. They're telling their story. So when you're doing your cross examination, which is a key part of the trial, are you using one or more or diff different techniques and why do you use them and how do you find them to be helpful? You know, what I found is um, the closed cross is the safe cross, first of all, and it is the cross that uh, is typically best suited for that seasoned witness who can really hurt you, especially oh, yeah. expert witnesses. You know, if you've got a professional expert on the other side who has the, the experience and understands how mm -hmm. to testify effectively and you don't use the closed cross where you're asking only leading questions, you're keeping that witness tied to a, a, a sequence of questions, then you're treading on dangerous ground if you get away from that because that witness can hurt you badly. They're going to hurt you badly. Quickly. Yeah. So in answer to your question, I think the closed cross is great for those witnesses who can that are really dangerous. I think the much more open cross, and it, it's not really what you're referring to as the Jerry Spence cross. I know what that one is, where you're basically just giving speech with every question, and you don't care what the answer is. That's right. fine. And, it, and I think that's an effective cross as well. It can be. But more often than not, I like to have different modules, different topics to cover with the witness. And if the witness pivots from my alignment of those topics and wants to go off and talk about something else, that's okay. Let's go. Let, I'll, I'll grab that folder full of materials and we'll go to that cross. And then I'll come back to my line of questioning because one, it's not so subliminal, but it is not a direct thing that you're doing is you're portraying to the jury that I can go anywhere you want to go in this trial. Right. I know the case well enough that I can pivot and go in whatever on whatever topic you want to go to next. And of course, you want to you want to force the witness to go eventually to where you need to be. But sometimes just allowing a free flowing sort of Muhammad Ali kind of cross right. is is very effective. And I've seen other lawyers, some on the other side of me who have done it extremely well. 
Well, some of the some plaintiffs' lawyers that I've talked to on this podcast have said things like, "Well, it seems like the defense lawyers are more willing to go fishing more often on cross, and they may ask one, two, or three questions and not get anywhere, and then boom, they strike something on the next question." What's your view about that? Um, I haven't noticed a. a, a a distinguishing element between the plaintiff and the defense lawyers. It's more about the lawyer himself or herself mm. and that person's particular style than it is whether the person was representing a plaintiff or a defendant. But I, I, I get it <laughs> that with in some cases, I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna land a knockout blow on every question. No, or on every topic. A nope. lot of them are you're trying to set up the ultimate question that's going to score the point for you. And so sometimes the the questions that seem to be going nowhere are actually the questions that are necessary in order to get to that knockout punch. Right. How about this little technical tidbit? Do you in your cross try to kind of orchestrate it? in the sense of you want to start off strong and end strong, or how do you do that? Most of the time, yes, that is the way I would like to do it. I'd, I would like to hit pretty hard right at the beginning because there is also a psychological effect that takes place between the questioner and the witness. Right. That if you've punched them in the nose a couple of times early, then they're going to lose confidence in themselves <laughs> up there on the witness stand, and that right. gives you an advantage. And so, yeah, I try to start out pretty strong if I can. Let me ask you about one other thing that uh, is commonly taught in law schools. You know, the old adage of don't ever ask a question where you don't know the answer to. And I, I think most of the time, maybe 99% of the time, that's good advice. But in my experience, there's occasional times when it makes some sense. So do you ever ask questions where you don't know the answer, and what types of situations do you do that in? Yeah, um, I've done that a number of times, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> it's the truth there, but um, there have been occasions when you just, it, you know, one of the things about trying lawsuits is you are in the moment. Yeah. You can't be thinking about what happened yesterday or what happened what's going to happen tomorrow. You got to be right. right. You're in the ring right then. And if you lose concentration or even a second, something suboptimal is going to happen. But sometimes when you're in the moment like that and you get to this point where you think you've got that person right where that, that next question that you don't know the answer to is going to help you it turns out right that you ask that question, even though you don't know the answer and you get a response that works to your benefit. But that's not only being in the moment, but that comes from a tremendous amount of preparation for that. Right. right. So that you have the confidence to ask that question. And then there, there occasionally there's a question where you've got the documents and it doesn't matter what the answer is. You can go one direction or the other. If the person says yes, then you go down this road. If the person says no, then you go down that road and you win either way. Hopefully. Right. That's that's my most common experience with asking a question. I don't know the answer because I've been able to figure out through preparation and you have to be thoroughly prepared. But I can figure out beforehand there's no good answer for them doesn't matter. And if that's my conclusion, because you really know the case, then okay, you can ask that question. But yeah. uh, you don't want to be do opening the door in bad situations. You just right. want to make sure you've, you're well prepared. I don't know if Clarence Darrell was the original um, person to say this, but there's a quote that is attributed to him that the most important attribute of a good trial lawyer is an iron rear end. Which means you you sat in a chair long enough going over the documents and preparing for the case and doing all the things that were necessary that you were thoroughly prepared. Yep. And you have to be thoroughly prepared to be a good trial lawyer and to be effective. And right. I'm sure you've always done this. One of the things I've always thought is 
I may not always be the smartest person in the room, but if I work my butt off, nobody can out prepare me. And you really got to know your case, don't you? Yeah. You know, my dad, uh, I grew up here in Arkansas and my dad was a country boy. And he said, when I, when I got out of law school, he said, son, let me tell you something. You can outwork about 90% of the people, but you can only outsmart about 10% of them. <laughs> that was good advice. Yeah. That was good advice. Well, we're going to talk a little more about other aspects of trial, but before we get into that, um, if you have any thoughts or perspectives, I'd love to hear them. And you may have this from your national abode work in the last year and before, but do you have any sense that juries are acting differently after we've come out of the COVID pandemic experience than they were acting before that experience? And what are your observations about that? I've got a couple. Um, there's certainly an opinion, a prevailing opinion right now, that when there are plaintiff's verdicts in significant cases, the damages are higher than they were pre-pandemic. That doesn't mean that they're more likely to be plaintiff's verdicts. It just means that the, the scale of numbers that have been discussed over the last few years has been a much larger scale Mm. on the top end, which causes us to think in bigger numbers. And so at least I know that's, that is a very um, popular opinion at this point among jury consultants and others who study the outcomes of jury trials. And I think the pandemic had something to do with that. I mean, just the volume, the, the number of dollars that were discussed in right. relation to the pandemic, how much um, supplemental money went into the the economy, how much the pandemic cost. It, it, all of those numbers are huge. And so if you got a significant plaintiff's case and if you get a plaintiff's verdict, there's a likelihood that you'll get more damages than you would have before. But I think the more telling um, change that I've observed is the acceptance of remote testimony. And that comes from what we're doing right now. Yep. I mean, 2019, uh, it was a it was very uncommon to engage in this discussion on a platform right. like this. We press the accelerator of technology for remote discussions, remote conversations, including remote testimony during the pandemic. And because we have pressed the accelerator on that, we also... Uh, accelerated the acceptance of that platform. And th that has two major effects, I think, for jury trials. Jurors are much more adept and willing to judge credibility on a screen now than they were four years ago. So they're more capable of doing yeah. that. Okay. Right. They, they've been they've gotten a lot more experience with it. They, they use Zoom or yep. Teams every day. Mm. And so they're able to feel more confidence about judging credibility of someone's testimony or what someone's saying on a screen than they were four years ago. They're also just more attentive to it. You know, one of the things that we've been talking about for the last 15 years in jury trials and in other things is attention spans, that uh, attention spans are shorter because we have all of this information coming at us all the time. You watch ESPN and you're watching a football game, there are three things scrolling across the bottom of the screen all the time. Yep. And that's because it's difficult. Those, those television stations know to capture your attention, they have to offer a variety of information. <laughs> And when we're in a jury trial, we're not doing that. There's no scrolling across the bottom of the screen. No. <laughs> but people are, we, we've uh, had to address attention spans on screens through Zoom and other platforms. And it, it's an interesting thing. I think that the attention span of somebody being presented on a screen before the pandemic was shorter than it is now. Mm. And so that's, a, I, I, that's just Steve talking. I don't have any data to support it. But it seems like to me, people are 
will focus their attention on something taking place on a screen longer and more intensely now than they did before the pandemic. I think you're right. And we've definitely gone through things. I do a lot of mediation and I was pleasantly surprised when the pandemic hit that you could effectively settle cases with Zoom. Nobody knew if that would happen. So that was a good thing right. to discover. Well, in terms of um, getting ready for trial and trying your case, do you, you've already mentioned jury consultants and I'm sure you use them on a regular basis. Do you use them in every case or most cases or uh, how does that work? Sort of depends on the case. Obviously, it depends on the, the size of the case. I mean, I still try small cases. I like trying cases. So it, I try cases that have significant dollars involved, and I try cases that aren't that all that significant. And obviously, if you've got a smaller case, you, you just it, the economics don't work to hire a jury consultant in those cases. Right. But um, and in other cases, even though they're large cases, you may the case may be. Um, straightforward enough that using a jury consultant might have helped, but isn't as important as it is in the more complex and difficult case um, where you've got challenging issues. So yeah, I use them pretty regularly, but not exclusively. So what happens with when you're trying a case where, you, where you've got a great jury consultant and there's your sense of the juror that you're thinking about whether you're going to strike or not is different from the consultant's sense. Um, when do you go with your gut instinct and when do you go with the consultant? Uh, there, <laughs> I've said this before. There can only be one captain of the ship. And if you're the lead trial lawyer in the case, uh, at some point, if you come to complete loggerheads with the jury consultant, which hardly ever happens, most of the time, we, we, you know, you say, yeah, I agree. Most of the time you agree. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time that you agree, that person's got to go. Yeah. Um, but where it gets difficult is when you get that, for example, in Arkansas, we typically have three strikes per side. Okay. When you get down to the third strike, the number one and number two, everybody agrees on. And then you get to number three, and is it this person or is it somebody else? And yeah. when you do come to complete loggerheads, in my opinion, um, unless I, I have a jury consultant that I think sees things so much more clearly than I do, I have to go with my gut instinct and just say, look, I, I, this person just rubs me the wrong way or I get a bad feeling or whatever it is. I, I, I can't deal with that. That makes good sense. Okay. So in addition to jury consultants, um, people will use focus groups or maybe do mock trials, but how have you found you use focus groups and do that often? And what kind of um, useful information have you gotten from that? Um, yeah, I've been, I've been using focus groups since the 1990s, for sure. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's a full-blown mock trial. You know, it's um, right. you're putting on witnesses, you're doing the whole thing and you got one of your partners playing the other side or something. Yeah. Sometimes it's more of just theme testing with a group of people. But what the, the benefit of it is not so much. It, is this are you going to win the case? Or are you going to lose the case? Is it worth X number of dollars or Y number of dollars? It's what is the reaction to this particular piece of evidence or this particular line of questioning? Or sometimes, you know, as lawyers, we see a document in a case and we think, man, this is either so powerful for our side of the case or so terrible for our side of the case. Right. And then you do a focus study on it. And sometimes the jurors just don't care that much about that thing that you thought was so important. And the uh, so you're testing particular elements of a case or particular documents or particular testimony. But. Frequently and most often it is, does this theme work? Yeah. Is, this, is this a credible story? And am I putting the focus on the right places in the story? That's what I get more than anything else from focus stuff. Or it can maybe help you with some bad facts and how you talk about them or how you right. phrase them. And, and part of it, I, I think, is you mentioned this earlier. You can't be too in the weeds as a lawyer. 
And the focus group helps you get out of the weeds and realize what do real people think about this who don't know anything about the case, right? Exactly. So I think it's really helpful from that kind of standpoint. So you're um, you're in trial, you're picking your jury. Um, in Arkansas, do you guys use many openings on a regular we, basis? We do not. I've, been, I've tried cases in states like California where you do many openings. We don't do those here. And I've, I have found them in some cases to be very helpful. They give the jury just enough so that they understand what's coming and they can they can evaluate the, the longer story better because they kind of have an idea of, okay, this person's arguing this and this person's arguing the opposite. Well, I don't know what you do in Arkansas, but in California, before we started having many openings, you would just be tasked with having this vanilla little summary of the case that didn't say a damn thing. <laughs> and it was pretty worthless. So yeah, we we have that here. The judge reads the statement of the case. Yeah, <laughs> and the statement of the case is usually one page. You know, um, the plaintiff in this case. This case involves an accident at Center and Main. Yeah, and the plaintiff was on Center Street. The defendant was on Main Street. One of them says the light was green. The other one says it was red. Well, now since you've had cases in other jurisdictions with many openings. What's your feeling about them? Do you think they're useful? Did you find them to be helpful in those cases? So here's where I found them to be most helpful is in the, the more complex case, the case, the more helpful the mini opening is mm. because it gives the jury a snapshot of what the case is about from each side. Yeah. And that snapshot is really important for them so that when they hear the longer opening, they can develop and understand they can build a story in their minds about what that case is about and they don't have to do it they don't have to put the puzzle together sort of after the fact well it kind of gives you uh, the ability to build your mini frame in your mini opening and then build your frame in your opening that right. you want them to filter all that information through yeah and frequently there's there is a focal point of dispute yeah and the mini opening also focuses the jury on where that dispute, where those two sides come together. Well, now one question I'll ask plaintiff's lawyers often, and I want to get your defense perspective on this, is the plaintiff's lawyer, when they've got a serious injury case, they're going to want to start talking about dollars and damages fairly early. Uh, but that doesn't always work well. So have you seen any occasions where a plaintiff's lawyer early on was talking about some of the damages, whether it's economic or non-economic, and did it, have you seen that backfire? Uh, and and tell us about that. Yeah, uh, most of the time it's in a case where, I don't know if this is a phrase that people use everywhere, gilding the lily. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they, they are overstating the damages and are overemphasizing the damages, leaving them that side of the case vulnerable to the uh, the opposing argument and and setting expectations too high you know it's the oldest maxim in all the trial books that you'll read is don't overpromise in your opening yep. also and don't build up expectations in the opening that you're not going to be able to fulfill and so if you are emphasizing the damages early with sort of extraordinary emphasis on the plaintiff's side, you better be able to back that up with some really powerful evidence because the jurors will create an image of what they think that's going to be. And then if it turns out to be less than that, I think you do have a diminishing return there. Yeah, and that goes back to the issue of credibility, doesn't it? Because yeah. if you do that, you may be setting yourself up to lose credibility, which is a bad thing at trial. Yeah. You know, that's one of the beauties of the reptile theory and, and David Ball's book, Damages, is both of those. They, of course, David was involved in the in the writing of Reptile with Don Keenan, right. a, former, a former national vote of president, by the way. But they both talk about put the discussion of damages, which they refer to as harms and losses, at the very end of your case. Don't talk about them at all until you have established the facts 
and you've constructed your opening in a way that gets you to where the jury will accept the harms and losses. Yeah, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that advice. Yeah. You know, yeah, my too. fear when I was trying plaintiff's cases, if I was talking about damages, I didn't want to offend the jury if they didn't know enough and thought I was some kind of a crazy person. Yeah, so you can alienate they, you can alienate the jurors if they think that you're you're unjustifiably asking for a large dollar amount. Yeah. So when you're in trial now, Steve, how do you deal with bad facts and how do you deal with sympathetic plaintiffs if you're the defense lawyer? You know, I've had cases where um, the plaintiff was incredibly sympathetic, sometimes an admitted liability case, and the damages are bad and it, it, it you couldn't come to a settlement because the demand was higher than your client was willing to pay. Yeah. And in those circumstances, I think it's 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 obvious, but it's very important to be genuine in expressing sympathy for the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you've got a case where it's not admitted liability. When you are, you've got a really strong defense to liability in the case, but the person on the other side has been tremendously damaged. And you have to be incredibly sympathetic in that case. You know, mesothelioma cases are that way. They're, mesothelioma is a terrible disease. Yeah, you, terrible. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want anybody to have mesothelioma. And that has to be a genuine statement at the beginning of the case because there is no way that you're going to overcome or or diminish the effect of that. Right. Mesothelioma is terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing if, if a plaintiff is just kind of malingering, but it's right. very different if you got a terrible thing like that. Yeah. Same well, thing for paraplegia or quadriplegia. You know, you got oh, those, yeah. those that, that's a that's a nightmare. Yeah. <clears throat> well, in uh in those cases where you're dealing with significant damages, and maybe you've got a liability defense, or maybe you're just trying to keep the damages at a lower level, what what is are some effective ways that you discuss with the jury when you're in your final argument? Uh, uh, how to think about putting dollars on these concepts. You know, when you're on the defense side and you don't want to talk about damages at all. Yeah, right. Would, when, when the damages are real and they're significant, you, you want to stay away from them, but you have to. And so this goes back to credibility and honesty. That I don't know if this is the most effective technique or not, but what I've typically done is to, be vulnerable with the jury and say, you know, I think this ought to be the end of the discussion. We should win on liability. But part of my job is to talk about the whole case. Yep. And I wouldn't be doing my job effectively if I didn't talk about, if I didn't talk with you about damages, because if you decide against my client on liability, then you have to move to the second phase of your evaluation of the case. And that's about damages. So now let's, let's talk about what the, what is a reasonable compensation for this particular set of facts? And so when you're trying to talk about reasonable compensation, how do you give them some analogies or stories to help them come up with some dollar that makes dollar amount that makes sense? Yeah. Um, sometimes what you're trying to do is simply scale it. So if, if, if the, Plaintiff was somebody who made, let's just pick a number, $75,000 a year or $90,000 a year. And they're asking for $9 million, and depending on what the damages are, of course. You would scale that by talking about how many years of work that would have been for that person. You right. Know, what that, and somehow you can scale that in comparison to wages or something of that nature. Um and then on other times, you know, I've heard lawyers do the three times compensatory argument. I, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who made it up, but I, I tried a case against a very old and very successful trial lawyer about 20 years ago here in Arkansas. I was on the plaintiff side. He was on the defense side. And it was a case that where liability probably should have been admitted, but it wasn't. So there was a little fight over liability, but the defendant was liable. 
And he did a wonderful job of, of taking the medical bills and saying, look, the medical bills are a pretty good evaluator of what this case is worth. And if you double those, then that's a pretty good evaluation of what the case is worth. If you triple them, then you're given twice as much, twice as much as the medical bills. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. You know, and, and he made it sound as if tripling the, the medical bills was some astronomical or, or extravagant or at least a very generous um, award. And that's what they did. <laughs> that's great. He well, was great. His, his name was Sam Lacer. And Sam tried over 500 jury trials in his life. Civil wow. jury trials. Wow. He was, he was incredible. He, he tried his last jury trial when he was 88. Wow. Heck of a trialer. We've got a fella here in San Diego who just tried his last jury trial last year and he was 90. So tell me his name. I think I met him when I was Jim there. Marino. You yes. probably met him. I met him when I was at the at the San Diego chapter meeting. Yeah, he is an amazing, amazing guy. So um we're near the end of our time, and this has been great. And I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and understanding. Let's just cover a couple of things to close it out. So let's say you're you're making your final argument, and you only get one shot at the final argument if you're on the defense side. Right. So what's your strategy and your final argument? You shared part of it a minute ago because you do talk about damages, even though you think you should win on liability. Any other strategies you follow in making your final argument? So, And this is a strategy that I learned early in working with some really fine trial lawyers when I was second chair and they were first chair. And that is that, especially if the case has gone on for several days, you know, and maybe even weeks, but several days at least, is to say to the jury, okay, I'm at the end of my closing here and the other side's about to get up and they're going to have things they're gonna to argue to you. I have made my points and you all know what my points are. And I think you know the evidence well enough that you know what I would say in response to the, the points that they're <laughs> gonna make. And so what I ask of you to do is in, when you get into the jury room, think about, well, what do you think Steve would have said in response to that last point that the plaintiff's lawyer made? Or what do you think Steve would have said in response to this? Because I think I have, I hope I have adequately evaluated the evidence in my closing argument in a way that allows you to be the ultimate evaluator and you can see all the pros and cons to the evidence just like I do. Yeah, that's Something a great like that. And I think that works. And I think it's a good way to do it. And it invites, you know, what, one of the things you always see is that there are some jurors in that jury room who may be in your favor and some who are in the other favor. And what you have to do is empower the jurors who are on your side to make your arguments for you. Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely a great strategy. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, we'll make this our final question. And, okay. uh, and that is, I like to close out with, Either what advice did you get as a young lawyer that was great advice as you became a trial lawyer, or what have you, what would you say now with your vast experience as advice for younger lawyers who want to become really good trial lawyers? Now, a couple of things. I'll put a plug in, first of all, for the uh, Aboda National Trial College, which takes place every two years. Absolutely. It's going to take place in August of 2024. It's a wonderful course. There are only 36 students and 18 faculty members. The faculty members are all about a trial lawyers. It's equally divided plaintiff and defense. And so one thing I would say is after you've practiced for two or three years, apply to be a, what we refer to as fellows of the trial college, because I think it's one of the best um, encapsulating moments of learning about how to be a trial lawyer that you can get. Second thing I would tell you is the same thing that I learned my second year in practice. I went to a, it might have been my third year in practice. I went to what I believe, and I'm pretty confident about this, was Irving Younger's last live lecture. Irving, yeah. And 
I walked up to him after the lecture. It was here in Little Rock. And I said, he had, he used to advocate, you got to try 25 jury trials before you really know what you're doing. And of course, 25 jury trials today is just phenomenal. I mean, yeah. it, would, it takes a lifetime to try 25 jury trials for most people if they can get that far. Yeah. Back then, you could try 25 jury trials in three or four years. But I said, I'm really anxious to get to that point. What can I do to accelerate that? What can I do to learn faster? And he said, read every trial book you can read. And he gave me a list of trial books. And I bought as many of them as I could find, and I've read them. I'll, I'll point out two or three. One of them was The Art of Advocacy by Lloyd Paul Stryker. You can see I've still got it flagged everywhere. I, re, I, I reread it every two or three years because it's just a great book about how to be a good trial lawyer. The other one is The Art of Cross-Examination by Francis Wellman. It was written originally in 19, 1916. Wow. And still full of really good information and, and, and anecdotal stories about cro not just cross-examination, but it, it's predominantly about cross-examination. More recently, of course, we talked about reptile and damages. I think those are good. But right. the other, another book is called Made to Stick. Mm. And it's a book about ideas that stick in your head. And those are the ideas that you want to portray. And it is in some ways derivative of Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Yep. Which is another one about the same thing. And then there's the creative side. And there are these books about storytelling for lawyers uh, Carrie Ruttenberg, who was a trial lawyer from Jones Day, who then became head of litigation at Walmart, wrote this book, Images with Impact. And that's that's about what can you do to illustrate or demonstrate the point. And so my advice to a young lawyer would be learn from your mentors as much as you can. Go to the courthouse and watch trials. Figure out a way to get trial experience vicariously that you can't get so easily these days directly. And then read books like that to try to understand what it is and what's required to become a good trial lawyer. Boy, that's great advice. And I'll tell you, the reading the books, you still read them, and that's critical. I mean, what I did, Steve, in the first 10 years of my practice, because I wanted to become the best trial lawyer I could be, the only thing I read outside of work was stuff on how to try cases and, you know, help me try to be a better trial lawyer. And you need to keep reading stuff like that. So. Yeah. That's a great example, and you have to you can learn from all sorts of places. And I think the other thing that you mentioned earlier is you always have to filter it with be true to who you are, and you may copy ideas from people, but they may not always work for who you are and your personality. That is so true. So you got to be true to you. So, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time today to be a guest and. I know the people are going to love this and they're going to get a lot of good information. So thank you for your service to Aboda this year as the national president. Thanks for being a guest on Trial Alchemy. Well, thanks so much, Monty. It's been the honor of my career to serve as the national president for Aboda. And I, it's been a great honor to be on your show. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.